Welcome to the Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. Our show today is Cold War Medicine in East Asia. And joining us via Skype from the Institute of Taiwan History at Academia Sinica in Taipei, Taiwan, is Dr. Michael Liu, Deputy Director of the Institute of Taiwan History. Dr. Liu is a highly accomplished researcher whose research has taken him to many parts of the world. Welcome to Asian Review. It's great to have you, especially since you're such a busy man traveling here, there, everywhere, in Taiwan, outside of Taiwan, to America, to Japan. You're really pretty hard to nail down. <laughs> well, thanks, Bill, to inviting me to uh, join your show. Well, it's part of my work and it's part of my research. <laughs> great, great. Well, um, now, we have a very savvy group of viewers, but some folks might not be familiar with Academia Sinica. So could you explain just a little bit about how it got started and what its mission is? Okay, uh, Academia Sinica was established in 1928. Well, basically, it was a design try to copy that uh, current uh, French system. Uh, to build Academia Sinica is the highest research institute, not only the think tank, but also the institute to promote a lot of uh, basic research, research for so-called uh, modernized China. Mm. So therefore, uh, in Academia Sinica, we have a lot of uh, basic research, not only focusing on the uh, applied science. Well, the, the person who started Academia Sinica was a very famous person in Chinese history, right? Hu Shi. Yeah. Uh, no, scholar. no. He is not the founder of Academia Sinica. The first the president is Cai Yuanpei. Oh, okay. But Dr. But Dr. Hu Shi uh, was a very key important person to bring Academia Sinica from mainland China to Taiwan. Okay. And of course, Cai, Yun, Cai Yuanpei was very famous in and of his own right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Great. Well, um, just for the benefit of our audience, uh, mention some of the institutes at Academia Sinica. Well, currently we have uh, 18 research institutes and divided by three groups of uh, the bioscience, the uh, natural science with mathematics, and also uh, humanity and social science. Great, great, great. Um, and um, the, the president, the Yuanzhang of Academia Sinica, is actually appointed by the president of Taiwan, isn't he? Yes, indeed. And he enjoyed, enjoyed the equal privilege with other uh, uh, Yuanzhang, like the Executive Yuan or other Legislation Yuan. It's a very high, it's really, it's really high, highest prestigious uh, status in our government. Right, right, yeah. And Academia Sinica is a very prestigious institute. I'm so fortunate to have been able to spend a year there and hope to spend another. Um, yeah, actually, uh, we welcome your, your, your return. Thank you, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Well, um, we should probably talk a little bit about how Academia Sinica is funded because I know some of our listeners are going to be thinking, well, how is this prestigious research institute and think tank funded? So can you give us some idea about how that works? Yeah, well, basically Academia Sinica steadily received a uh, governmental uh, budget. However, all the, sorry, <coughs> all the researchers has the right to apply the outside funding, either from the government or from the uh, private sectors. We also received some research donation from the private foundation, including domestic and also abroad. Mm, great, great. Well, now let's move to um, the Institute of Taiwan History, with, which of course you're the most familiar with. And tell us a little bit about how that got started and what its mission is and what it seeks to do. Okay, well, uh, my institute was established in 1993 uh, on the pre preparatory office basis. Well, as people know, in 1990s, there's a trend that in our society try to promote knowing Taiwan, either from the uh, uh, sociology, uh, the, the angle of sociology or uh, political science. However, uh, from the historical uh, angles, will be must was most popular one. So uh, in 1993, the Academic Syndicate decided to prepare the, to set up an office for my institute. After 20 years, uh, 
the my institute was officially established in two thousand three. Hmm. Hmm. I see. And um, was it Chen Shui Bian himself played a very instrumental role in founding the institute, didn't he? Yeah. Well, during the Chen Shui Bian's regime, my institute uh, was greatly expanded to touch a lot of a uh, research field that we haven't been touched before. And we also, we were also encouraging to promote our international status during his regime. Mm. And so for such a long time, anything that dealt with Taiwanese history, Taiwanese issues was so suppressed. And, and Chen Shui Bian really wanted to bring that out and give that attention. Isn't that yeah. correct? Yeah, right, indeed, indeed. Well, as people know that uh, the, the study of Taiwan history uh, compared uh, in international society was not a significant one. Mm. However, it was very important. It is very important to the Taiwanese population. So during the Chen Shui-bian's government, he tried to promote the study of not only the Taiwan history, but also the Taiwan studies. Mm. And this policy has been continued by the Ma Ying-jeou's government. Although the direction or the support direction is slightly changed to focusing on the relationship between Taiwan and China. But the, the main focus haven't been, haven't been changed since uh, Chen Shui-bian's government. Mm. Great. Um, good. Um, well, now let's. You, you had a book that came out previously um, called uh, Prescribing Col uh, Colonization The Role of Medical Practices and Policies in Japan Rule Taiwan, 1895 to uh, 1945. Do you yep. want to tell us a little bit about that book? Okay, that is the book uh, published by the uh, Association for Asian Study in the United States. And the book focusing on how Japanese convert the Western medicine to for for the use in in in, in colonial Taiwan. Well, um, my argument is that well, in 1870s, Japan first started first uh, Westernized its medical systems by copying the German system. Mm. However, mm. the German medicine only bring the concept of a start medicine. In German, that's state medicine. Mm -hmm. And Germany doesn't have the chance to bring its very own design for colonial medicine to Japan. However, the Japan occupied Taiwan in 1875, uh, eight, sorry, 1895. Mm -hmm. So it, it left Japan has no time to uh, learn the colonial medicine from, Bre from Britain. So the Japan has to come out with its very own idea, max up its traditional uh, uh, medical practice with the German medicine and parts of the British medicine in India to create its very own Japanese colonial medicine. My book is talking about the whole process and how uh, how the trans uh, transformation of from the German state of medicine to very old Japanese colonial medicine using Taiwan as the laboratory basis. So um, what, that's, what you said is interesting about the uh, British pra practice of medicine in India. So, in a way, Japanese colonial medicine sought to bring together German state medicine and British colonial medicine in India. Is that, do I yes, have, do I have that right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, really yeah. interesting. Yeah. German medicine is very centralized. However, the jo the Japanese government, due, uh, before the 1940s, uh, especially before the 1930s, doesn't have such manpower. Or the or enough uh, enough uh, financial support to create a, such a centralized medical service mm. in Taiwan. So mm. it has been learn it. The government, the Japanese government, has to learn had to learn something from the British experience in India, but not totally, because mm. uh, Jap the Japan Japan Empire mm -hmm. is still quite focusing on how to centralize its colonial power mm. in Taiwan. Mm, really interesting. And of course, Japan always looked at Taiwan as a kind of a model colony. For, uh, and, and if it could yeah. develop it as a model, it, it felt that its, um, how should you say, its conquest of Southeast Asia would be a lot easier. Yeah, it did. Well, based on, based on the medical service in Taiwan, it's not only created a very unique Japanese colonial medical, uh, med medicine models, 
but he also spread this Taiwanese model to Korea after 1911, mm. and even tried to spread the same design after Japan moved southward to Eastern Asia. Especially, there are several uh, several designs uh, we can we can we can focus on. The first one is the so-called public medical services by using the local uh, medical manpower, mm. and the other mm. one is focusing on the public health rather than bring in the, uh, mm, the uh, skillful uh, medical practitioners. It significant, this kind of a design significant, significantly um, reduced the financial burden of colonial government, but reached a very high achievement. So actually Korea, even though it was a colony uh, at that time, it benefited from the um, medical, um, how should we say, Practices developed in Taiwan. Yes, yes. That's especially the public medical service system. So uh, when when um, Japan first came to Taiwan to take control of Taiwan in 1895, what were some of the prevailing diseases that they really had to deal with? <clears throat> okay, malaria was the very severe mm. in the very uh, in the very big since the very beginning. However, the Japanese doesn't have any experience to deal with this uh, endemic illness. So they first build the people's confidence on their modern medical uh, power, um, eliminate plague and cholera. It mm. was so international famous uh, epidemics. And this strategy not only win the Taiwan's uh, confidence in Japanese medicine, but also win the Japanese medical circle high reputation from its international uh, counterparts. Mm. Mm. W was there any kind of Chinese medicine woven into Japanese colonial medicine? Yeah, that's a very tricky question here. Well, the <laughs> Japanese first, <laughs> that, that's the Japanese kind of questions first we want like, to, tricky ones. Uh, want yeah. to totally convert or suppress the traditional Chinese medicine in mm. Taiwan because the Chinese medicine well, meant to the Japanese Empire was outdated. Mm. So the modern Western medicine was brought in as an excuse to modernize Taiwan, not colonize Taiwan. Mm. Yeah. But was soon, uh, soon after the Japanese occupied occupied Taiwan, the colonial government realized they still have to rely on the people who use the traditional medicine to cure the population. Mm. So in the first ten. In the first decades, the, jo the Japanese government tried to negotiate with these traditional medical practitioners and eventually convert their practice to, um, to uh, convert their practice to the modern medicine. And uh, as the research I also found, the, third, uh, the, the second or the third generation of these traditional Chinese uh, uh, medical practitioners, their descendants was accepted by the colonial medical school to, and eventually became the Western doctors. We're going to go to break now, and when we come back, we want to really get to uh, the essence of your more contemporary research, which deals with exactly what the title of today's show is, The Cold War Medicine in Asia. So uh, you're watching Asian Review. I'm interviewing Dr. Michael Liu, uh, Deputy Director of the Institute of Taiwan History uh, at Academia Sinica in Taiwan, and we'll be right back. Hey, has your signal just been taken over, or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Carol Mon Lee, and I want to welcome you to our newest series called Education Matters, where we will explore education-related topics that touch everyone, not just formal programs in K-12 and higher education, but also broader issues and information that affect our community. My name is Calvin Griffin, host of Military in Hawaii, which airs here on Think Tech Hawaii every Friday at 11 a.m. Please join us. We'll be talking about issues concerning our military, veterans community, and other related issues that concern all of us. Aloha, this is Kili'i Akina with the weekly Ehana Kako. Let's work together program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network, Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. Movers and shakers and great ideas. Join us. We'll see you then. Aloha.
Welcome back to Asian Review. I'm your host, Bill Sharp. My guest today is the, Dr. Michael Liu, uh, Deputy Director of the Institute of Taiwan History at Academia Sinica in Taiwan. He's coming to us via Skype from Taiwan. And we've been talking about um, uh, Academia Sinica. What is, what is it? How did it get started? What the Institute of Taiwan History seeks to achieve? And he also talked about a book that he wrote uh, concerning the medical practices of the Japanese colonial government when Taiwan was a Japanese colony from 1895 to 1945. We want to move on now, and uh, we want to talk about uh, his most contemporary research, which deals with the uh, Cold War medicine in Asia and the specific role of Taiwan in that. So. Give us a sort of an overview here. <clears throat> okay. Well, before I uh, directly touch the topic, I'd like to bring some uh, historical background about the, the research I'm doing now. Sure. Well, uh, in 1949, that uh, the national government was retreat, uh, retreated, was, re was retreating to Taiwan because it, uh, the government was defeated by the communist government mm -hmm. at the time. However, from the viewpoint of American government, they still try to uh, preserve their benefit or their connections with the Chinese government, either the nationalist one or the communist one. So uh, when the communist, uh, no, when the nationalist got moved to Taiwan, uh, it still struggled. It was just struggling to regain the support from the American government. However, as we all know, the communist, the, the Chinese communist government doesn't want to cooperate with the American government mm. in the 1950s. And the situation getting worse after the outbreak of the Korean War. So uh, my research is going to focus on how American government convert its, uh, its, uh, its relationship with the formal enemy, that's Japan, and using Taiwan as the little China to uh, spread it out its experience during the Second World War to cooperate with the national government in China, in mainland to, to lay out the foundation for its international medical aid in Cold War Eastern Asia. Mm. So that, that's very interesting. If I understood you right, the U.S. was cooperating with Japan on medical oh, issues and to develop medicine that could be used in China? Is that right? Yes. yes. Okay, that's very well, interesting because the Japanese, okay. some of their medical experimentation during World War II, especially in Northeast China, was, I, okay. I would think, not a model. <laughs> yeah, well, there was, a, there was one thing that a lot of uh, uh, historian of Cold, Cold War uh, historical Cold War his history has been overlooked. Well, when we say Cold War, basically we are transferring the experience in Europe, but in mm. in East Asia or mm. in Asia. Let me think of that. Mm. In 1950s, we have a Korean War. In 60s, we have a Vietnam Vietnamese War. Mm -hmm. So the Cold War never cold in Eastern Asia. Mm -hmm. So the United government really needs something they can rely on, they can learn from their historical experience. And that is military medicine that developed from the, from the cooperation between Chinese government and American government in 1940s. Hmm. So actually the international health aid or international medical aid under the American uh, Cold War policy was actually based on the military medicine experience that uh, uh, during the 1940s. However, it also come, it come from China. But in 1950s, as I said, the national government became relatively weak and cannot control the mainland China. Mm. So the American State Department decided to switch its, uh, its a coordinator in Asia from China that is Taiwan, probably, mm. but to its former enemy, the Japan Empire. Mm. So in 19, since the 1951, we saw that Japan became a medical log logistic supplier to the Korean War. 
And in the 1960s, the Japan became the biggest investor to the medical development, especially pharmaceutical industry in Taiwan, to support the uh, the military need, especially the American soldiers' need in Vietnam War. During the Vietnam War. During the Vietnam War in 1960s to Is 1970s. That right? I, didn't, I never knew that. Oh, that's very interesting. A lot of antibiotics medicine actually was produced in Taiwan, and the pharmaceutical company actually was totally under the control of a Japanese pharmaceutical company, but funded by American money. There's, there's a, as I understand it, there's a lot of tie-ups even today between Japanese pharmaceutical companies and pharmaceutical companies in Taiwan. There's a lot yes. of cooperation. And yes. uh, I, if yes. I go to a drugstore in Taiwan and buy some sort of medicine, I, I it almost looks and feels japanese to me. Yeah. Yes, indeed, indeed, indeed. <laughs> and uh, because of all these phenomena, I gave a, uh, I, I give the uh, a hypothesis that actually the Cold War medicine under the Amer American policy actually extended, extended the Japanese colonial medicine. Uh, uh, to 1970s, even the Jap even the Japanese Empire was defeated in 1945. Mm. So the the framework of Japanese colonial colonial medicine has been prolonged during the Cold War, Cold War situation in East Asia. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Very interesting. Wow. So um, now, what are you going to do with your research? Are you hoping to write an, another book, or this is going to be uh, for some paper that you present at a conference, or what's what's the goal? Okay. Well, what in fact I have I have already published two articles uh, about this uh, topic, mm. but right now, since uh, my work in uh, Johns Hopkins, I tr I still try to finish my book manuscript. Because that is the way I can make all story clear to 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 the readership. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Wow. So, um, so you published two papers, but is there a book coming? Uh, not that soon, because I still deal with uh, some statistics issues. Well, compared to the pre uh, compared to the pre war period, especially the situation in men in China, uh, I I have to deal. I have to deal with a lot of uh, uh, demographic data, mm. and that is something I I need time to uh, calculate to uh, aggregate these data and go through the analysis. It, it probably will still take one or two years to finish the uh, book manuscripts. Right, right, right. It's a slow process, as I found out. Yeah. Oh wow, that's pretty interesting. Now. Um, you, you mentioned South Pacific. Uh, were these policies or the, um, the, the Japanese medicine developed in Taiwan, was it also used in the South Pacific? Yes, a little bit, especially when we consider the WHO West Pacific office, uh, original office was established in 1951. And in the very beginning, the American experts actually fully occupied the regional office in Manila mm. nowadays. But soon after that, under the a, a special, very unique program called the Economic Assistant, uh, Economic Assistance mm -hmm. Program, that Japanese Japanese expert of a former colonial colonial medicine was recruited by the regional office as their new regional expert. Mm. So it's became to it, the situation to me became very interesting that uh, how this Japanese expert was retrained by American, uh, pay, by American sub, uh, subsidized program and again circulate in this region as their uh, predecessors before 1945. Hmm. No, that's very, very interesting. Um, well, we, we're down to maybe our last uh, few minutes here. And, um, you know, a lot of uh, people, when they think of Taiwan, when they think of medicine, they, they think about the Taiwan National Health Plan, which is a, a model national health plan. And I, I was thinking that uh, in the last few minutes that we have here, it might be worth saying a few things about that, since it's a highly respected health plan. Um, does, does, does the health plan benefit from any of the, how should I say, the, the 
the, from the Japanese model? I mean, because Japan has a very good national health model as well. Um, well, I, yeah. And, and well, was I, that yeah. in contemporary Taiwan, did contemporary Taiwan borrow a lot from the Japanese national health plan? Well, it depends on how we define it. We, uh, we, we, we have been benefited from the Japanese assistance. Mm -hmm. uh, in colonial period, we have, the, as I said, the public medical service system, but it's not that important during that time. But it brings up the confidence for the society and also a faith that the medical service should be merciful work the government should, should, should carry out. So mm. from the kinds of a social phase, when the when the Taiwanese government tried to promote the national health insurance program in 1980s, it became a very soon became a very welcome plan. Mm. And mm. even the even the medical practitioner, they were willing to sacrifice some of their re even revenue and their privilege mm. to support this program. I see. Well, you know, the clock is sort of caught up with us again. The clock is so unforgiving, and I'm afraid that we're going to have to end here. But uh, I want to thank you for joining us today, and certainly, um, and certainly for you, you know your input. And I'm sure that we've all learned a lot. And um, I want to thank the audience for uh, watching, and I want to uh, ask you to join me again next week when my guest will be Mr. Eric Huang, who is the spokesperson for the. Chinese Nationalist Party, who currently is a graduate student at, um, the, uh, in Washington, D.C. So we'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. One second.